Hi, this is Paul. Um, I started a commentary series on this book, and some of you have been teaching me how to say that Ch Pajot's name properly, for which I am grateful. Uh, sorry, Matcha, if I don't say it right, or if I continue not to say it right, um, you can you can butcher Paul all you want. I won't be offended. Uh, you won't though, because you speak both languages, and I don't speak French. But I've again, I think this is a very important book, and um, even though I'm doing a commentary on it, I'm I wouldn't be commentary commenting on it if I didn't think it was an important book, and uh, because I think what he's really working on addressing is absolutely vital and foundational. I did a conversation today with BookWave, which is sort of a uh, great books, book reading group that's on YouTube. And I've had a conversation with one of their members before. And I thought we had a really terrific conversation today, which will come up on my channel. It'll be on their channel. And I did mention this book there because what, um, what the other Peugeot is trying to do is similar to what his brother is trying to do, just taking a different take on it. And it's a really important thing. Now, I think C.S. Lewis actually addressed this earlier, and I had made a comment about the epilogue of Lewis's book, and Byrne, who told me it was his favorite book, gave me a little correction in the comment section, which I took to heart, and I thought maybe what I should do is actually read the entire epilogue and do a little bit of commenting on that. So, this is the epilogue of The Discarded Image. Epilogue. The best in this kind are but shadows, Shakespeare. I have made no effort to hide the fact that the old model delights me as I believe it delighted our ancestors. Few constructions of the imagination seem to me to have combined splendor, sobriety, and coherence in the same degree. It is possible that some readers have long been itching to remind me that it had a serious defect. It was not true. I agree. It was not true. But I would like to end by saying that this charge can no longer have exactly the same sort of weight for us that it would have had in the 19th century. Sorry for the volume change. It won't happen again. Windows, when I do Zoom, likes to readjust the volume at some settings beneath the settings that are on OBS, and I always have to check them before I come on. Tricky windows. Okay, back to the text. We then claimed, as we still claim, to which much more about the real universe than the media, um, to know, to know, much more about the real universe than the medievals did, and hoped, as we still hope, to discover yet more truths about it in the future. But the meaning of the words know and truth in this context have begun to undergo a certain change. The 19th century still held the belief that by inferences from our sense experience, improved by instruments, we could know the ultimate physical reality more or less as, by maps, pictures, and travel books, a man can know a country he has not visited. And that, in both cases, the truth would be a sort of mental replica of the thing itself. Now, what Lewis points out there. And I'm really glad that I came back to this book and reread the epilogue. I read this book about a year and a half ago for the first time and haven't reread it. And I really should reread it because I've learned a lot in the last year and a half. But what Lewis points to is something that he pointed to in that important chapter in his book, Miracles on Horrid Red Things, where he basically makes the observation that in many ways, we think in pictures. Now, now, Lewis will sometimes charge people with picture thinking, and it's not a compliment when he does, but I, I think in many ways this exaptation that John Verveke talks about and the parabolic knowledge that Mark and Manuel and Mary like to talk about has everything to do with these pictures. And, and I think it's for this reason that you know, when I would, before I ever started on this YouTube thing, I had a friend who uh, taught at a couple of colleges around here, and for his general education class, he would he was um, he was enamored with a lot of uh, New Age type thinking, and he liked Native American spirituality. He'd been raised on Puerto Rican Roman Catholic, but he liked a lot of these things, and, and would have me come in and talk about Christianity. And I would regularly ask the class if they thought the world was round, and they'd all raise their hand. 
and then I'd ask if they how they knew the world was round, and they almost always default to do things like globes and pictures from the moon. Then I asked them how they could test if the world was round in a way that anybody could see, and none of them had the answer for that. Well, I did have an answer for that that I could give them. I've given it in previous videos. But it was interesting that it was something that none of them had ever thought of, yet they simply, based on authority, believed that the world was round. Well, that roundness of the world, to answer the question, that, that has become just so much obviousness to all of us, is sort of a picture that we have in our mind. And this grasping which, of course, John Verveke talks about in Awakening from the Meaning Crisis. This way of knowing is because it seems that our brains have basically leveled up from very elemental things, and so images and pictures and models and constructs are the ways that we basically are able to apprehend the world and manipulate the world in our minds. That is, for us, simply a matter of thinking. And now Lewis is pointing out that over time, a lot of this thinking has continued to change. So I'll reread this. The 19th century still held the belief that by inferences from our sense experience improved by instruments, we could know the ultimate physical reality. And again, I think physical is the best word. Physics, physical, laws of physics, all of that. Physical reality, more or less by maps, pictures, and travel books, a man can know a country he has not visited. And that in both cases, the truth would be a sort of mental replica of the thing itself. Philosophers might have disquieting comments to make on this conception, but scientists and plain man did not much attend to them. Already to be sure, and, and I think what we're we're coming up to here is the meaning crisis because, as I've said before, and, and maybe I should have this conversation with John more directly, I think in many ways the meaning crisis has two sources. On one hand, we discover that the universe is stranger than most of our mental pictures. Our mental pictures have mostly been of physical things that we can sort of grasp and know and apprehend, like those little pictures of atoms and things like that. Those are That's part of the reason we have such atomic ways of thinking, that, that we learned that, well, we learned and took on authority from scientists that the world was stranger than this. And that, well, there's all these waves, and these waves sometimes cohere into matter, and that there's, there's something which is much more difficult for us to imagine, and our imagination goes to, say, waves on a lake or waves on the sea or waves in water or waves in air even, although that's harder for us because we can't see it. We can't feel it like we can feel waves in water. We can't have the experience of going into it. And, and so physics is increasingly telling us that the world is stranger than the sort of pictures that previous centuries had sort of led us to believe. So that's one half of the meaning crisis. The other half of the meaning crisis is that, well, some of these things that we have sort of pictured, dynamics, processes, to speak Canadian, um, all of this, well, I actually think processes, 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 um, all of this, in fact, impacts us. And so the world is stranger and we are more constructed than we thought ourselves. And again, the previous era, that the world was more atomic and we were sort of exceptions in the world. And now we are less exceptional and the world is stranger. Okay, and I think those two things really deeply contribute to the meaning crisis. Already to be sure, mathematics were the idiom in which many of the sciences spoke. But I do not think it has. It was doubted that there was a concrete reality about which the mathematics held good. Again, look at concrete reality. There's a there's a very vibrant, and of course Lewis is a master of words. There's a very vibrant picture of the world because when we hear concrete reality, we think of concrete. Concrete is the sort of thing that you know if you've ever fallen down on it, you know that your skin gave and your body did not. It's like, ouch, concrete reality, something we can't resist. But I do not think it was doubted that there was a concrete reality about which mathematics held good. 
distinguishable from the mathematics as a heap of apples is to the process of counting them. Think about that again. But I do not think it was doubted that there was a concrete reality about, with, about which mathematics held good. Distinguishable from the mathematics as a heap of apples is from the process of counting them. We knew indeed that it was in some respects not adequately imaginable quantities and distances, if either very small or very great, could not be visualized, even just the distance between here and the sun, 23 million miles. I know what a mile feels like to walk. I know what a hundred miles feels like to drive. I know what a few thousand miles feels like to fly, but I struggle with a million anythings. But apart from that, we hoped that ordinary imagination and conception could grasp it. So we just think, okay, 93 million miles, it just kind of big. And you know, remember before I talked, I talked about consciousness. Consciousness is one. And then we sort of can manage dualities, like one, 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 one. And then three things, one, oh, that's hard for us to manage with consciousness. Anything above three is just kind of, okay. And then we sort of default to, well, four. Four is a number we can manage. But we manage four in different ways than we manage dualities, okay? We should then have thought, mathematics a knowledge not merely mathematical. We should be like the man coming to know about a foreign country without visiting it. Okay, So again, it's quite likely that many of you have had the experience of travel, that you've had the experience of anticipated travel, that you've had the experience of prepared for travel, before, for example, I went to the Dominican Republic for the first time. I had all sorts of ideas about it, you know, brushing up on Spanish, learning about the culture. In fact, before the Dominican Republic, they were going to send me to Brazil, but that sort of fell through. And um, I did all this preparation to go to Brazil, and I never got there. But then I went to the Dominican Republic, and um, I had all of these imaginations of what the country would be like, and quite frankly, after living there for more than six years, um, I didn't know anything about the country before I went there. I knew a bunch of things about the country. I knew they spoke Spanish. I knew it was half the island of Hispaniola. I knew they had pretty beaches. I knew that I would be working with Haitians who cut sugar cane and pick coffee. And I knew it would be different. And I had traveled to Nicaragua and Honduras and Costa Rica and so I'd done a little bit of travel in Latin America, but when I got to the Dominican Republic, it was very different. And there was a sort of knowing, and this is where we get into this, this knowing that we keep talking about over in the Verveke corner of the internet. There's a certain sort of knowing that I just, I just could not have had before I went there. Similar things when last year I visited Hawaii and Australia for the first time. I had lived in the Dominican Republic, so I had understood what it's like to live in a, in a tropical country, in a tropical island surrounded by the sea, but Hawaii was very different, and Australia was even more different. So there's a lot going on with this knowing business, and, and Lewis is making the, the connection to mathematics and knowing. I can know that it's 93 million miles between here and the sun, but what it would be like to travel between here and the sun in, in what? In a, I don't even know what it's like to be in a spaceship. Well, maybe it would be like being in a jet aircraft. I've been in those. but And, and, and so right away, there's a, there's a certain... A, a knowledge of math that, after a certain point, it sort of becomes like the travel books. He learns about the mountains from carefully studying the contour lines of a map, but his knowledge is not a knowledge of contour lines. The real knowledge is achieved when these enable him to say, that would be an easy ascent, or this is a dangerous precipice. A would not be visible from B. These woods and waters must have a pleasant valley. 
and going beyond the contour lines to such conclusions he is, if he knows how to read a map, getting nearer to reality. So you can see that he's, as he's sort of imagining his way into it, that he can sort of do with contour lines. But again, I would say he would not even understand these contour lines if he had never been to a mountain before. And, and perhaps had go, having gone to a mountain with a map, with contour lines, was able to sort of associate mountainness, both the suchness and moreness, of mountainness with the map that he has right there. It would be very different if someone said to him, and was believed, but it is the contour lines themselves that are the fullest reality you can get. And turning away from them to these other statements, you are getting further from reality, not nearer. All those ideas about real rocks and slopes and views are merely a metaphor or a parable, we're getting to parabolic knowledge, and a peace aller, which of course I had to look up, a course of action followed as a last resort. In other words... The contour lines themselves are not a fuller reality. Now, this gets tricky because if you are, in fact, climbing up a trail by virtue of how the geography might be around you, you might not be well aware of the fact that you are, that this is, in fact, a steep rise. Now, perhaps if you get to the end and you're huffing and puffing and you pull out a map, you could say, oh my, I just ascended a thousand feet. Oh. And we're at 6,000 feet of elevation. Oh, well, seeing the math, you might say, okay, now to a degree, because I know something about climbing high and hiking in the mountains. We have these beautiful mountains in California. That I know something about contour lines. And so, in fact, when my family and I go to Yosemite and we're looking at hikes that we might like to take, they have all these indications of easy, moderate, difficult. And so they'll tell you this has... 2,000 feet of, of elevation change in it. So uh, get ready to do some huffing and puffing if you're in your 50s and watching your kids in your 20s just kind of walk up the thing. So, you know, this is, uh, so the question is, well, well, well what is real? And, and how is the real known? But it would be very difficult if someone said to him and was believed but it is the contour lines themselves that are the fullest reality you can get. In turning away from them to these other statements, you are getting further from the reality, not nearer. What other statements? The statements about that's a dangerous precipice. A would be visible from B. These woods and waters must uh, make a pleasant valley. That's getting further away from reality or closer. And, and you begin to see some of the tension between, well, science, which is all of this math, and this lived experience. All of those ideas about real rocks and slopes and views are merely a metaphor or a parable, permissible as a concession to the weakness of those who can't understand contour lines, but misleading if they are taken literally. We're knocking on the door of Brett Weinstein's metaphorical truth in a way. And this, if I understand the situation, is just what has now happened as regards the physical sciences. Now, now, what's really interesting here is that the guidebooks and the maps with the contour lines, people will say, well, that, that exposes the truth about the mountains. But here's a funny little situation. What if they fudged? What if they cheated? What if, what if the contour lines are inaccurate? Where do you actually go to check the contour lines? You have to go back to the mountain itself. But if I'm in another country reading the travel book, I can't check. I've simply taken them on authority. That's what I've done. And, and I would imagine, oh, I'm sure that there are checkers out there that make sure all of these maps are correct. Have you used your GPS lately? And this, if I understand the situation, is just what is now happening in regards to the physical sciences. The mathematics are now the nearest to the reality we can get. Anything imaginable, even anything that can be manipulated by ordinary, that is, non-mathematical conceptions, 
far from being a further truth to which the mathematics were the avenue, is merely analogy, a concession to our weakness. Without a parable, modern physics speaks not to the multitude. Right there, parabolic knowledge. Without a parable, modern physics speaks not to the multitudes. In other words, you might say to an expert, well, there's 10,000 feet of elevation there, and myself, who lives in Northern California and loves to go up to the Sierra and loves to go up to Yosemite, I have a pretty good idea about a bunch of places that are at about 10,000 feet. And I know what 4,000 feet is like, and I know what 7,000 feet is like, and I know what 10 or 11,000 feet are like. And I can, I can, in fact, when I think about 10,000 feet, I think of Tuolumne Meadows. And I have many, many pictures of Tuolumne Meadows in my mind, and I've Tuolumne Meadows is one of my favorite places to be. And then you keep driving. Now, a lot of driving for me, so there's another experience. Keep driving beyond Tuolumne Meadows over the pass and then down to Mono Lake. And I just have lots of wonderful memories about this and all of this experience. And I can, since when I'm there, I'm often paying attention. What's the elevation here? What's the elevation there? What are the peaks that I can see? I like that sort of thing, so I pay attention. But uh, what is the parable and what is the science? Even among themselves, when they attempt to verbalize their findings, the scientists begin to speak of this as making models. It is from them that I have borrowed the word. For these models are not like model ships, small-scale replicas of the reality. And whenever, well, you go to the Museum of Sciences, the Academy of Sciences in Golden Gate Park, wonderful museum, uh, you will see all sorts of models there, but they are not really like model ships. Now, if you go to um, Sausalito in the Bay Area and you look at the Bay Area model, well, that's a model. In fact, that's a working model and they have little pumps that put the water in and take the water out and they have it all set the scale. At least the model is accurate to, I don't know, the 1950s when the thing was made because they couldn't do computer modeling. But again, when we use computer modeling, a computer model is not like the Sausalito Bay mo model. You can walk and say, okay, is there a computer model? And you show me a computer. You walk and see the Sausalito Bay model and you walk into a room and there's a whole... There's the Bay Area all out before you like a, a model ship. But these models are not like model ships, small-scale replicas of the reality. Sometimes they illustrate this or, as, or this or that aspect of it by analogy. And so again, a model of the Bay Area tides and water systems, that is a computer model, is very different from that scale model. The, the model is only looking for specific aspects. There's sort of a relevance realization going on in that model of the whole thing. And that model can be very accurate about some things. None of us are denying that. In fact, we the, the, the meteorological models are telling us that there is a, what, what are they calling it now? Oh yeah, an atmospheric river. Many of you will have noticed that in the last few years, meteorologists have taken to giving us more and more vivid language. A polar vortex, an atmospheric river. Now, you would imagine that, well, I've got the Sacramento and the American rivers here, would imagine that it's like the Sacramento River up in the sky? Well, it's like the Sacramento River. Oh, you mean, but but can I can I fish for salmon in it? Do do the do the sea lions make their way up from the delta through it? No, there's no salmon or sea lions in that atmospheric river. Well, then why are you using the word river? Because I know what a river is like. I swim in rivers. I've been boating in rivers. I'm quite accustomed to rivers. I've grown up by, I've lived by rivers most of my life. No, not that kind of river. Then why did you use the word? Well, because we're trying to evoke, and what they're trying to evoke is a lot of water. Fair enough. It is from them that I've borrowed the word, but these models are not like model ships, small replicas, small-scale replicas of the reality. 
Something they illust- sometimes they illustrate this or that aspect of it by analogy. Sometimes they do not illustrate but merely suggest like the sayings of the mystics. An expression such as the curvature of space is strictly comparable to the old definition of God as a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Did you see what Lewis just did there? I'll read that sentence again. An expression such as the curvature of space is strictly comparable to the old definition of God as a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Now, you might say, now, wait a minute. I know how a circle works. A circle center is here and its circumference is here. And so, but God, whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere, that's like the curvature of space. Both succeed in suggesting Each does so by offering what is on the level of our ordinary thinking. Nonsense. In other words, we cannot imagine a circle whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. Well, what about the curvature of space? Well, there's a model that uses that, but it doesn't work in ordinary thinking, sort of like the atmospheric river that is coming tonight. By accepting the curvature of space, we are not knowing or enjoying truth in the fashion that was once thought to be possible. It would therefore be subtly misleading to say, the medievals thought the universe to be like that, but we now know it to be like this. Part of what we now know is that we cannot, in the old sense, know what the universe is like and that no model we can build will be, in that old sense, like it. Understand what Lewis is saying there? He's saying that our models have changed, and, and the medieval models, in a sense, had a certain, had a certain scalability to them. That's why the earth was flat. That's why the sun went around the earth. You know, someone, um, Christopher in the comments said, you know, phenomenological, that's the word that Jonathan Peugeot uses. So their new models, well, they don't work like that. And it's in that sense that, well, I'm holding in my hand all of those waves that have come together into particles. Yeah, but my hand is also made up of waves. Well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. This, this, this stand outside of me is waves. What do you mean I'm waves? See, now I'm having a meaning crisis. I'm waves. I, I, I thought of me as, as me, as a story, as, as this, as this being that that is conscious but is is beyond conscious because every night I sort of go out of consciousness, but I'm still me. And when I wake up in the morning, I'm still me. And now things are getting strange. Again, such a statement would suggest that the old model gave way simply under the pressure of newly discovered phenomena. As a detective's original theory of the crime might yield to the discovery that his first subject had an an unassailable alibi. And this certainly happens as regards to many details of the old model, just as it happens daily in particular hypotheses in a modern laboratory. Exploration refuted the belief that the tropics were too hot for life. The first nova refuted the belief that the transluminary realm is immutable. But the change of the model as a whole was not so simple an affair. In other words, well, they began to see that certain that certain understandings of the old model could not anymore hold. But this transition isn't quite as simple as throwing out one model and embracing another, especially when the new models are so strange. The most spectacular differences between the medieval model and our own concern, astronomy and biology. In both fields, the new model is supported by a wealth of empirical evidence. 
but we should misrepresent the historical process if we said that the eruption of new facts was the sole cause of the alteration. In other words, it wasn't just facts that we bumped into. The old astronomy was not, in any exact sense, refuted by the telescope. Remember, the math worked better. The scarred surface of the moon and the satellites of Jupiter can, if one wants, be fitted into a geocentric scheme, as they were in some ways. Even the enormous and enormously different distances of the stars can be accommodated if you are prepared to make their sphere the stellatum of vast thickness. If you look at my video about the firmament, well, you can still have your Genesis 1 firmament with the sun, the moon, and the stars all in the firmament if you put the entire universe as seen and understood by physics within that firmament and say, oh, I get it. The waters are outside the universe as we know it. You know, you can accommodate it and still have your waters above, but in some ways then the Genesis flood of Genesis 6 through 9 is having to travel all the way through space, light years and light years and light years and light years, all the way to drown the little world and then go way, way, way back out, back to space. In other words, the moon had better be, better be careful or it's going to have a flood too. How far, by endless tinkering, it could have kept up with them till even now, I do not know. But the human mind will not long endure such ever-increasing complications if once it has seen that some of the simpler conceptions can save the appearances. And Lewis puts that in quotation, obviously with a nod to his friend Owen, Owen Barfield. Neither theological prejudice nor vested interests can permanently keep in favor a model, capital M, which, which is seen to be grossly uneconomical. The new astronomy triumphed not because the case of the old became desperate, but because the new was a better tool. The math was better. Once this was grasped, our ingrained conviction that nature, capital N, herself is thrifty, did the rest. Occam's razor in some ways. When our model is, in its turn, abandoned, this conviction will no doubt be at work again. What models we should build, or whether we should build any, if some great alterations in human psychology withdrew, this conviction is an interesting question. But the change of models did not involve astronomy alone. It involved also, in biology, the change, arguably more important, from a devolutionary to an evolutionary scheme. Okay, And you can read that in Charles Taylor. And you can read that actually in G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton raises that point exactly. Before, the models were sort of devolutionary because there was an original, pristine, primeval, prelapsarian world which devolved into the earth, which was the lowest realm of the heavens. Of course, there was the level below, which would be hell, but the realm above, well, you get to the moon, and of course, Lewis lays this out in the previous chapters of the book. It involves also in biology the change arguably more important from a devolutionary to an evolutionary scheme. Now, now one of the interesting things about the, the devolutionary and the evolutionary is how these things are really still at play with us. Why, when I go to the grocery store, do they charge for organic or natural foods rather than what's unnatural foods? Well, what do we mean by unnatural? Well, foods that we've tinkered with as if you can really find almost anything that hasn't been tinkered with. And then I go to Costco and I can find granola from ancient grains. Well, what does that mean? Because, well, I don't know if you would find some grains that have been sitting in some clay jar for a few hundred years. I don't think the Food and Drug Administration would allow them to make granola out of that. 
What do you mean ancient grains? Well, we have this idea that before, now notice what imaginaries we're evoking, that before all this industrialism, things were pure. And if we would only eat this pure food, then we wouldn't have cancer and heart disease and all of those things. We would lead healthier, more meaningful, more beautiful lives. Now, lately, all the rage is a certain um, YouTube channel with a Chinese woman, very attractive Chinese woman in her 20s, who is tilling the soil and growing the food and making her furniture and I don't know if there's elves or fairies that are walking around with these high-definition cameras and elves and fairies that are doing all that video editing because the channel is beautifully done. But and then at the end of the at the end of the episode, she always sits down with her grandmother and they eat this natural food. Now one might ask if this natural food, which is grown by her own beautiful hands and lovingly worked into a gorgeous, I imagine, a delicious meal. How grandma got so old and shriveled. You would imagine that that food would keep us from getting old and shriveled, but the age of decay does seem to go on. But we do have devolutionary ideas that continue to rummage around in our imaginary and lead us to spend more money on organic foods rather than the inorganic foods? No, that's not the right word. The factory food? You think those ancient grain granola in that plastic bag came from somebody behind an ox? No, it came from a factory. Anyway, it involves also in biology the change, arguably more important, from a devolutionary to an evolutionary scheme from a cosmology in which it was axiomatic that all perfect things precede all imperfect things. Let's see what his footnote is there. Just a regular footnote. To one in which it is axiomatic that the starting point, I remember looking up that German word, but I don't remember what it is now, is always lower than what is developed. Now, when Jonathan Peugeot had his sit down before the big wave with Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein and Brett kept talking about higher and Jonathan Peugeot kept saying, <coughs> excuse me, what do you mean higher elevation? Is that at 6,000 feet instead of 200 feet? What do you mean higher? Well, Jonathan had a real point. Um, starting point, which is always lower than what is developed, the degree of change can be gauged by the fact that primitive, in italics, is now, in most contexts, a pejorative term. Now, things have changed since the 1960s when Lewis wrote this because, well, ancient grains and organic foods and ice drawn from glaciers and icebergs is now far more costly than regular food. This revolution was certainly not brought about by the discovery of new facts. When I was a boy, I believed that Darwin discovered evolution and that the far more general, radical, and even cosmic developmentalism which till lately dominated all popular thought, was a superstructure raised on the biological theorem. This view has been sufficiently disproved. The statement, which I have just quoted about the Ant Vic Lungsgrund, and there I did look it up, reason for development, was made by Schelling in 1812. In him, in Keats, in Wagner's Tetralogy, in, in Goethe, in Herder, the change to the very point of view has already taken place before Darwin. Its growth can be traced far further back into Leibniz, Ackenside, Kant, uh, some more Frenchmen, um, Ma Per Tice, I don't know who even that person is, um, Diderot, already in 1786, 
Robinet, Robinet, I assume that's French, believed in an active principle which overcomes brute matter and la progr progression n'est pas fine, which means, thanks to Google, the progression is not over yet. For him, as for Bergson or Deschardins, the gates of the future are wide open. For demand for a developing world, a demand obviously in harmony both with the revolutionary and the romantic temper, grows up first. When it is full grown, the scientists go to work and discover the evidence on which our belief in that sort of universe could now be held to rest. In other words, the master and his emissary. The imagination first captured, oh, we must be progressing. And then the scientists go and prove, yes, see? The master and his emissary. The intuitive brain says, aha, I see. And the emissary says, okay, give me a little time and a little bit of math, and I'll prove you're right. There's no question here of the old models being shattered by the inrush of new phenomena. The truth would seem to be the reverse, that when changes in the human mind produce a sufficient disrelish of the old model and a sufficient hankering for some new one, phenomena to support that new one will obediently turn up. I do not at all mean that these new phenomena are illusory. Nature has all sorts of phenomena in stock and can suit many different tastes. This is the way in which relevance realization gets very tricky. And if you're going to look for something, usually you can find it. And we see that played out in the United States right now with our political debates. Do you imagine that the Trump organization was plotting the overthrow of the constitutional, um, constitutionally validated Biden administration? Go look for that evidence. You'll find it. Do you believe that the Trump organization was trying to overturn the, the constitutionally elected government of the United States? Go look for that evidence. You'll find it. Well, which is true? Well... That's not the point of this video. Maybe YouTube will do a little disclaimer beneath. An interesting astro astronomical change in our model is going on at present. 50 years ago, if you asked an astronomer about life on other words, worlds, he was apt to be totally agnostic about it or even to stress its improbability. We are now told that in so vast a universe, stars that have planets and planets that have inhabitants must occur times without number. Yet no compulsory evidence is to hand. Well, and we've continued to look since the 40, 60 years since Lewis wrote this. But it is irrelevant that in between the old opinion and the new, we have had the vast proliferation of science fiction and the beginnings of space travel in real life. Pay attention to the imaginary. This is what, for Vakey, they're finding zombies and zombies and vampires and monsters. And surely we're heading for a disaster in the world, aren't we? I hope no one will think that I'm recommending a return to the medieval model. I'm only suggesting considerations that may induce us to regard all models in the right way respecting each and idolizing none. We are all, very properly, familiar with the idea that in every age the human mind is deeply influenced by the accepted model of the universe. But there is a two-way traffic. The model is also influenced by the prevailing temper of mind. And again, Lewis in some ways is anticipating Thomas Kuhn's The History of Scientific Revolutions. We must recognize that what has been called a taste in universes is not only pardonable, but inevitable. We can no longer dismiss the change in models as simple progress from error to truth. No model is a catalog of ultimate realities, and none is a mere fantasy. In other words, all models have a degree of relevance realization built into them because they're looking at the particular model. The Bay Area model in Sausalito, California might in fact have 
a lot of reality to it that a computer model doesn't, even if the computer model can more accurately predict, let's say, tidal flow in a particular storm because it's talking to other meteorolo meteorological models. And in fact, the non-physical meteorological models that are probably informing the engineers that continue to run the Bay Area model, or maybe they're hobbyists now, because all of the engineers have discovered that the computer models work best, even though the computer models are all just digital zeros and ones, and the Bay Area models, well, that's physical. Each a serious attempt to get at all the phenomena known at a given period. Now you're seeing the relevance realization come in there. And each succeeds in getting in a great many. But also, no less surely, each reflects the prevalent psychology of an age almost as much as it reflects the state of the age's knowledge. In other words, we made the models to look for something. And I just recently watched a YouTube video about statistics. And, you know, we, we share the statistic usually where we want to make the sociological or the rhetorical point. Hardly any battery of new facts could have persuaded a Greek that the universe had an, an attribute so repugnant to him as infinity. Hardly any such battery could persuade a modern that it is hierarchical. I tweeted that a couple of days ago. Such fun. It is not impossible that our own model will die a violent death, ruthlessly smashed by an unprovoked assault of new facts, unprovoked as the Nova of 1572. And in fact, I think... Part of what we're seeing now in terms of this ongoing war between the liberal modernist of the IDW that are saying science to those who are saying, well, I just saw YouTube uh, TikTok today saying that you thought Christianity was colonistic and patriarchal, secularism is too. So someone who watches my video tweeted out, we've been discovered. They've discovered that secular is Christian too. And so down with it all. But I think it more likely to change when and because far-reaching changes in the mental temper of our descendants demand that it should. And I think this is exactly what we're seeing. Now am I seeing that which I believe is relevant to the models I have? I'm sure I am. The new model will not be set up without evidence, but the evidence will turn up when the inner need for it becomes sufficiently great. There's a room at Hogwarts that seems to fit this description. It will be true evidence, but nature gives most of her evidence in answer to the questions we ask her. Here, as in the courts, the character of the evidence depends on the shape of the examination, and a good cross-examiner can do wonders. He will not indeed elicit falsehoods from an honest witness, but in relation to the total truth in the witness's mind, the structure of the examination is like a stencil. And we're all used to seeing this on how many court TV type things, where the really crafty lawyer is able to draw from even a hostile witness the much-needed evidence to release the innocent client from the grip of conviction that the hostile witness has, along with the prosecuting attorney. It determines how much of that total truth will appear and what pattern it will suggest. And, yeah, so there's... There's the epilogue of Lewis, and I think, again, he's basically making a point that, well, we wield science. And as Peugeot made a video about, well, we're following the science. Well, yeah, but you're sort of following the people who are doing the science, because science doesn't do itself. Now, I'm not, as, you know, if you think this thing through, you could come to the very disturbing 
reality that, well, maybe those postmodernists have a point. Yeah, they do. But they also have other things that they themselves have to face. And so I think we can see here in this the fruits of the meaning crisis and where this is really taking us. So there's the epilogue, and I'll just kind of put this in as an addendum to my last commentary video so that when we get back to the next chapter, and the chapters are short, the next chapter in Mathieu Pajot's wonderful little book, I can reference it. Thanks for watching.